talked about this this kind of unique and unusual season that we've been through, but also the one that we're now entering into and journeying through. And I think what's interesting about this whole season has been how we have shared an experience that in a unique way has affected one of my colleagues talks about the three E's, everyone, everywhere, in everything. So it's had this, this massive impact almost in a moment. And I don't know how ready you guys were um, for lockdown to happen. You know, I'm one of those people I always think ahead. I plan ahead on our team. I'm very much the person who's always thinking, where are we going? What's coming next? How are we going to manage it? And, and this took me really by surprise because I don't think I've ever not seen something coming before. Just because of the speed with which it hit and how, how quickly and dramatically it changed everything. Uh, I think that was quite a shock, just the practical reality of what that was going to look like. And when we first hit lockdown, that was a huge initial shock and a very big adjustment. And I think a lot of people went on to a sort of crisis mode. And as psychologists, we know about how human beings react to short term crises. And what we saw then was very typical, that there was a fairly high stress level. People were wired because they were coping with new stuff. But it's also very novel, it's very unusual, you're very motivated, you're problem solving all the time. Some people even find it in a weird way quite a buzz because it is a new and exciting time. There's lots to distract you, lots to keep you focused, lots to be getting on with. And I think we saw that at the beginning of lockdown. We were very much living one day at a time, heads down thinking, well, what's the next challenge? How do I get my shopping? What does it mean if I'm supposed to be shielding? Can I go to work now? My kids can't go to school. Really practical stuff one day at a time. What does it mean if I'm no longer going into work and I have to figure out how to do that from home? Do I need to buy a printer or, you know, what are the practical challenges of that? Then we settled into lockdown. And we did settle in, you know, I've been doing a, um, a weekly little thought every Sunday throughout lockdown. I can't believe I did my 14th um, over the weekend. 14, that's a lot of weeks that we've been doing this for. And I think when we went into it, we perhaps didn't realize how long it would last. Although people said that it, it's likely to be right through into the summer. I don't think any of us could really process that at the beginning of, well, was it the end of March, mid to end March, wasn't it? Because it just feels so long and so impossible and so crazy that it could last for that kind of length of time. But we did settle there for, and, and what this means in your brain's terms, three months is a long time, so you did settle. We're talking now about new normal, but you settled into one during lockdown, which was a new normal. You got used to a new way of living, a new way of doing life, a new pattern of demands, a new rhythm of what it was that it meant to be doing your life and work and the other responsibilities that you have. Um, and we hit during lockdown really different challenges and, and very different depending on our individual circumstances. And one of the challenges that we've seen in this season is that although we've all been hit by the same circumstance, the individual expression and experience of that is so varied. And we've seen, as is often the case, gaps opening up in terms of what people are going through, what their experience is that can sometimes be quite stark. So for some people, uh, because of the nature of their job, for example, they were immediately put onto furlough or unable to go into work. And what they've had is the challenge for three months of a total loss of productivity, total loss of their normal activity, their normal routine. Feeling like you're achieving something is such a basic human need and it's so hard to lose your whole rhythm and routine. And some of the things that maybe even contribute to your identity, your sense of who you are as a, as a, as a valued person in society society or in your community that's really hard at the same time at the other end of that spectrum some people have been hugely busy maybe they're frontline workers and their job or their workload has been much higher than normal shifts have been longer than normal or they've been juggling work and homeschooling as I say that's the position that my husband and I've been in so we've been absolutely flat out because not only are we working in full-time jobs but we're having to figure out how we time team between us to teach our son luckily for us our daughter's 15 so she kind of teaches herself but you know to be around meaning we're having to work um, both of us have to work evenings as well as daytime because we share the daytime teaching as so basically just working flat out to try and keep the levels of work that we would normally get through in a week so that's a big difference 
we've seen other differences as well. Some people have been locked down with their family. For some people, particularly if you've been furloughed, this has been hugely valuable, unique time. If you've got kids at home or other relatives who live with you, to get to do that time with them, maybe to homeschool them, maybe to find new ways to chill out and relax together. I know people for whom this has been an amazing time. But at the same time, many people have been locked down on their own. They've been completely isolated. Maybe they've been shielding. So even if they're in a household of other people, they haven't been able to interact and open up with them. For them, this has been a hugely difficult time of utter isolation, of the lack of social contact. Even a, a hug or a hand on the shoulder has been forbidden for three months. And that's incredibly, incredibly difficult. Financially as well, of course, some people's financial circumstances haven't changed, but for other people, they've had the worry of how they're going to continue to pay mortgages, to keep the family fed, all of those sorts of things that some of us have taken for granted. So we've seen these gaps open up. And we, this has all happened at the same time that basically our life has moved from real interaction physically into online versions just like we're doing right now you know it's so amazing to get to do this with all of you guys but I've never met any of you in person it's great to see your faces on screen but but it's a different type of interaction isn't it and three months ago like how many people had even been on zoom I'd done a few zoom calls but it's like oh man it's that weird thing where you have to do it on the computer but then suddenly in a moment this becomes our way of life it becomes what we're doing and it's very, very different. And that too has brought its own challenges, its own opportunities in terms of connection, but also its own challenges. So it's been really different. It's been a really unusual time, but we've got used to something. And then, of course, we have moved into the latest new season, haven't we? Where we're going back to normal. And the weird thing about returning to normal is that you think it will be really easy because you're going back to normal. Hooray! People are expecting emotions like happiness, joy, celebration, relief. But actually, we got used to lockdown. So going back to normal is still a big change it's a big adjustment even if you are able to return back to elements of your normal pre-lockdown life if you can even remember what that was and the other problem is of course is it's not normal is it it's just not normal there are some things that feel normal but there's an awful lot that isn't and so we're managing a lot of what psychologists call dissonance when you've got one experience that clashes with something else. So you're walking down the street to do your shopping and it feels normal, but then someone's walking the other way and they're wearing a face mask and your brain will grab your attention when it sees that because that is not normal and it's a sign of potential threat. So it's gonna trigger anxiety. Anxiety is your brain's smoke alarm. It's your brain's way of warning you something significant might be going on. And so you see someone coming the other way in a face mask and even though you don't want to because it's a little bit rude, you double taped, you've looked at them because your brain's grabbed your attention and said, look at this, look at this. And then of course you're like, oh yeah, loads of people are wearing face masks, it's fine. And you carry on. But there are lots of moments like that where on the one hand it feels normal, on the other hand it isn't. And also in this season, there is more challenge to us because we're trying to go about things as though they were normal when they're not. Not. So people I'm talking to, particularly in frontline professions, are now trying to continue and reintroduce normal stuff, but they're doing it under the pressure of having to do it with the, the continued existence of COVID. So this hasn't gone. So people who are returning to work are having to do it with social distancing or with new rules and regulations all the time to update. So I, for my church, it's me who writes and updates all all of our COVID guidelines for staff, for the church, for people who are coming into our building or whatever. And oh my goodness, it's just the latest batch of regulations that we've got to figure out. What does this even mean? And that has become actually much harder in this season, hasn't it? Because lockdown was, a, it was difficult, but at least it was clear cut. You just don't do anything. Whereas now it's much more difficult. What do we do? What don't we do? What's safe? What isn't safe? And for us as human beings, that means we're having to tolerate a degree of risk. We're having to make decisions all the time about what we do and don't do. And that does create anxiety for us as individuals because we are having to step into situations where there's a degree of risk. 
And the more you perceive your own personal vulnerability to, to, to be greater, the more anxiety you'll experience. So obviously those who know they have an increased vulnerability to this or people who are currently shielding but know that is about to come to an end, um, that we're seeing a lot more anxiety and worry from people in those positions about making those everyday decisions that we're now having to make. But also it's creating conflict and debate and argument, isn't it? Gosh, I don't know if any of you have been like me since the last set of government guidelines, but sometimes I just feel so exhausted with the debate and discussion from people. Is this okay? Isn't it okay? Oh, I've invited so-and-so around to my house. Oh no, you're only allowed two households. Ah oh, yes, but one of them's bubbled, so it doesn't count. You're like, oh my goodness, it's so complex. Is anyone else in that space with me? So we're dealing with a lot more complication, a lot more what I would call cognitive load. Your brain is, is tired. And, and hey, we are already tired, many of us. I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges we're facing. And I know this is a form of a lot of people who will have continued to work in some form through this whole season. And particularly if you have kept working through the whole season or stepped up your work or had to juggle new responsibilities of caring alongside work, new stresses, new difficulties. Many people I speak to are exhausted right now. It's like we have three months of being on high alert and now who knew we have to go into another one. I heard a great way of describing it the other day. It's like you thought you were running a marathon and it turns out it's a triathlon. You finish your run and then someone gives you a bike and says, now you have to get on the bike. And you're like, what? I thought I was finished. That's how it feels right now that really spoke to me I don't know if it speaks to anyone else so it's difficult and what I want to talk about tonight therefore really is three things that we need to consider in this season as we go into the new normal or whatever this next stage is going to bring because the reality is we are still dealing with a lot of uncertainty and that's part of the difficulty and part of why there is um, some vagueness around some of these guidelines because we don't actually know what's going to happen next certainly through the summer months but much more importantly into the autumn as temperatures drop and and we move into this season where we we don't quite know how the virus is going to respond so three things that we need to be thinking about Number one, then, is about the way that your stress system works, recognizing stress peaks and managing those things. So in talking about this, some of you will have heard me explain this when I did the Soul Survivor talk, if you've watched that. But for those who didn't, what we need to understand is that when I talk about stress, I'm not talking just about distress. So things that are emotionally distressing are stressful for us, but stress is about more than just distress. Stress is about anything that requires your brain and your body to respond, to adapt, to adjust to a demand or a change in the world around you. And so in this season, just the level of change and uncertainty that we're experiencing, even if you've not found it distressing, it is stressful just because of the level of demand that it's placing on you. You're just having to think more and deal with more. Um, and, and something like a complete change to your routine actually is, is hugely triggering in terms of how it raises your stress level. Because one of the ways that your mind keeps your sort of baseline stress low is by routine. So most of your daily life before all this crazy season happened, your mind didn't have to think about too much. It's like climbing a wall, you know where all the handholds are, you do it every day you can do it without thinking or your your drive to work those of you who drive where regularly you probably get there and realize you don't remember most of the drive that's that's literally because your brain is able to switch off almost all of its focus it's alarming sometimes how, how much it can do there because it's routine it's procedure it's something that you do all the time and that's very low demand. What happens in a season like this where suddenly nothing is routine, nothing is regular, everything is different, is that your mind's having to think all the time. You're climbing the same rock face, but the handholds have all moved. Or maybe there are some extra obstacles that aren't normally there. You get there and suddenly there's an extra boulder in the way. You've got to figure out how to get around it. Sometimes you've even got to hammer in a new handhold to get around that sort of thing. So the demand on your brain is much higher and it raises your baseline of stress. And the thing with stress, if you think of it on a sort of scale, a bit like naught to 10 scale psychologists love scales, is we all have a crisis point. 
And it's like, it's sort of the eight to 10 zone at the end of that scale. And it's a bit like your stress levels got some up to here if it was a water level. And it's where your, your capacity to manage the level of demand on you is reaching its limit because you're, you're actually not superhuman. You do have a limit to how much you can hold in your mind at once and just keep track of and juggle. And when you get to this point, it's, it's very uncomfortable. You're not designed to function at this level for a long period of time. Humans are very good at doing that for, for short-term crises. But, but in something like this, when it becomes long-term and more drawn out, that, that's exhausting. It's a very difficult way to live. The second interesting thing is that your physiological system for stress is the same system that certain emotions operate on, things like frustration and anxiety. So if your baseline is up here, you can imagine that little emotional triggers are a bit like waves in that pool, if you think of it as a pool. And when your baseline's low, those little waves are no problem at all. You can handle them really well. But when the level's up here, they suddenly become very critical. So it's like somebody's stacking the dishwasher wrong in my household right now. It's like, are they, are they trying to push me over an edge? Because I'm already here. Why, why would you put a cup in in a way where it's just not going to get clean? That, that's just going to drive me absolutely crazy. Because, because my level is, is really up here. And I don't know if anybody else has just noticed that their tolerance has got much, much lower. Their fuse is shorter than normal. I'm a big time biker. I love to cycle. And um, oh, I was so grateful that throughout lockdown, down, I was able to keep doing that. And the roads were so empty, it was just amazing. There were times when it was wonderful. Um, but I can tell you the drivers were so crabby. I have never been yelled at so much in all my days cycling. Um, I think just because everybody was very prickly, they were very near the edge. And again, that doesn't help with things like the levels of conflict that we're seeing, both in, in workplaces. So when I'm talking to people about workplace dynamics, I'm hearing a lot about the challenges of dealing with conflict. Silly, petty arguments that have become much bigger issues than they normally would. People acting and reacting to things that normally wouldn't bug them, but are really genuinely upset by them, finding them really hard. Even people considering moving, moving on because from jobs, changing their circumstances, making dramatic changes. Because when you're up here, little things just feel like the final straw so, so easily. So if you're in a position where it feels like everybody around you has suddenly become a hundred times more irritating than they ever were before, and you're thinking like, how did I ever work with these people before? Maybe you're more irritable and they actually haven't changed. And it's to do with where your stress baseline is. Anxiety as well, that sort of baseline feeling that you never completely relax. You're always slightly anxious, always slightly buzzy, slightly switched on. Your brain literally, when your stress level's up here, your brain is on a sort of high alert emergency setting and it becomes very twitchy. So, you know, in the night, if you wake up and you think you've heard a sound in the house, suddenly you can hear every other sound in your house things you would never normally notice that's the same thing your brain has gone onto that highly alert mode and and if your stress baseline is raised you're like that but for everything little things you're going to notice them pick them up and it will trigger anxiety when they wouldn't do normally so a lot of people are dealing with more anxiety and becoming more reactive it's like the smoke alarm that goes off every time you put the toast on and they're doing it in a season when they're actually there is more to, around to worry about the normal as well. So it's a double whammy. And I'll, I'll speak about the challenge of emotions like anxiety in a moment. But all of that means that one of the most useful things that we can do for ourselves and the poor people who have to share space with us in this time is think about what is it that we can do to manage our stress levels? How can you drop your overall baseline stress level? What are the things? you can do that are like pulling the plug out in that pool so the water level drops down and there's two main things that you need to think about the first one is about getting into and trying to maintain where you can rhythm and routine in changeable and uncertain and unpredictable times and that's why at the beginning of lockdown you did hear so much about routine and whether it's joe wicks doing his pe every day or or you, you, your boss or if you're the boss setting up the weekly zoom at exactly the same time as the normally normal weekly team meeting would be that's because the more we can maintain routine and predictability the better it is for our overall stress levels and that continues now, really. So whatever your next few months are going to look like, the more you can conti continue some of the routines that you had in place through lockdown or build into this next season some more routines and rhythm and regularity, the better.
and little things do become very soothing for your stress system so i i've been able to do my same pilates class that i used to go out to at the same time each week but on zoom and little things like that that are still your you they, they feel normal they to a degree they're regular they're predictable your brain likes that they're like the pegs in your week that it can hold on to the stepping stones in your week that you can jump from one to the next to the next and get through your week so think about how you can do that rhythm and routine the second thing is about one particular group of things you need to build into that and that is things that are relaxing and particularly when we're super super busy when we're under a lot of demand and challenge we can think that time spent relaxing is time wasted. We should be being productive the whole time. Maybe there are increased demands that you've somehow got to figure out how to respond to. But those moments in your week when you are able to get out and get headspace, get rest, get relaxation, get away from some of the demands on you, they're not just valuable. They are possibly the most productive things that you do in your week because they enable and refuel you for everything else that you do. And otherwise, you might manage to keep going on pure adrenaline and grit and determination for a period of time, but you will get exhausted. And the risk is, is that then your productivity will drop, your ability, your performance will drop, you'll start to hit out and those emotions will start coming to the surface, it to the surface more often. You're not going to act and react as well to any of the demands on you. The people who will who will get the rough end of that first will be your loved ones, the people in your household, the people you least want to suffer because of it. Uh, but it will start to have longer term consequences and even on your physical and mental health. So we have to recognize in this season, as much as in any other, we are human beings, we have limits and that's not a bad thing. And so therefore we need to build into our structure and our routine the important things that are going to keep us going there about fueling and sustaining this because this is not a short term acute crisis. We are going to continue this even into the autumn. I hope and hope and hope and pray that the schools will go back in September. But if they don't, my job as mum is to still have the energy somehow to keep doing that. And to do that, I have to take time out. I have to make sure in August that actually I do take some kind of holiday break, even though because of my role, I, I have a lot more work that's continuing through the summer than normal. But, but I've had to think, okay, I, I actually do need to think, how can I fit that in? So think about how can you build in rest and relaxation. Let me just mention really quickly before I move on as well, sleep, because so many people are struggling with sleep in this season. And building stuff into your routine that's gonna help you sleep, building good sleep routine in, the things that you can do before you go to sleep that help you switch off, not like sitting up in bed on your laptop until literally the moment before you lie down and then expect your mind to magically switch off. Very few people's brains work like that. Just having enough time in bed, actually getting enough sleep, thinking about what you can do to try and maintain that, that's really, really important as well because obviously sleep is the main time every 24 hours when that baseline can drop. And it's essential as well in, in refueling and re-energizing both your body and your brain. So we do need to prioritize that. So that's my number one of three, is thinking about how we manage this longer period of stress and, and try and keep our baseline low so that when the peaks happen, when the challenges happen, because they always do, the little arguments or the niggles or the challenges that we have to solve or the flipping Wi-Fi goes down just as you're about to start some majorly important work zoom call with the big boss from wherever it is that your head office is located you know these things will happen and the more that you can keep your baseline stress level low the better you will handle those moments number two then is about how we manage those difficult emotions because it's been great to see so much around in this season about pos positivity and gratitude and the importance of some of those things and they are important and i will touch on some of that in a minute but emotional well-being isn't about denying the existence of challenge and negative emotions. It isn't about some kind of resolute positive mindset. La, 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 la. We must pretend everything is absolutely okay. Otherwise, everything might go wrong. Again, you, you might might manage that in the short time head down just don't think about it keep going but in the long term those emotions their job is to get your attention it's your brain trying to tell you that potentially significant things are going around and if you don't give it good headspace and choose good and appropriate times to ex express and process those emotions they will start to bubble up at times that are least convenient for you 
So sleep is a really interesting example. So, so many people say to me, you know, the problem is, is that I lie down at night and the minute I switch out the light, my head is just alive with thoughts and worries and anxieties. And the thing is very often your brain has been trying to get your attention for those things all flipping day, but you were too busy. You lie down thinking, great, now I'm going to get some rest and go to sleep. And your brain is like, aha, finally, now I can talk to you about all these significant things. So much better to plan some time and space in your day where if there's worries or concerns or challenges that you have that you do think about those and put some time aside to do that properly work with your mind not against it otherwise you'll end up having to deal with them at less convenient moments and there's probably three main emotions that i think we all need to think about how we deal with in this season so I've, I've talked about two of them already so i'll tick those off first so fr frustration i i've talked about a lot possibly because i am quite crabby at the moment just according to the people around me but i am also very aware of being on a shorter fuse than normal again just be aware of that frustration is such a difficult emotion it so needs to be expressed and it's it's hard to hold it in and we do need to find appropriate ways of dealing with it letting off steam you know i said i'm a biker biking is absolutely essential for me right now because i i need to let off some steam and and frustration is such a physical emotion sometimes we need to physically pound it out or do something that can release that frustration that's built up if you don't frustration either comes out against other people or potentially even worse it, it gets directed in at yourself and so maybe the, the goal that you didn't hit, the thing that you didn't manage to do, whatever it is in your week, that you start to beat yourself up with it. You start to attack yourself. You start to compare yourself unfavorably to everybody else. Frustration can be brutal inside your own mind. So think about how you're dealing with and expressing frustration. Anxiety is the second one. So as we are in this season where we will experience more anxiety, that smoke alarm will be going off more. We need to think about how we manage it. Where are the spaces to express and process it? Where do we need to put boundaries in actually? So a lot of people I'm talking to struggling with anxiety. The constant discussion, hypothesis, debate, alarm triggering that's on the media has been very unhelpful to a lot of people. And at the end of the day, remember the job of the media is to keep you turning your radio on or your television on. They basically do have to fill space. And, and discussing and debating things that probably will never happen is a wonderful way of doing that. So they will always be talking potential worst case scenarios. Do you think this is gonna happen? Do you think this is gonna happen? Most of those things probably won't happen. In a time when it's so uncertain, they will be talking about what well, maybe this, maybe that, maybe the schools will be going back in September. Maybe the students will have to take their exams early. Maybe, who knows? Until it's certain, my advice to you is don't bother listening to it because the chances are you spend 24 hours worrying about it, then you turn the radio on tomorrow and it's changed anyway. So if you know that anxiety is a struggle for you, be, be careful about your boundaries about when you listen. That's why the government were doing their five o'clock announcements to try and limit. There was just one time a day when you got information. I know they've stopped doing that now, but think about it. Is there just one news report that you listen to once a day? Or do you even need to do it that often? You know, I'm finding, I don't know about you, I'm finding a lot of the things that these politicians say, actually I could live without hearing personally, but have a think about it anyway. And be aware of the impact anxiety is having on you. You will have to hold some anxiety in this time. Your brain spent two months learning to link being at home with being safe. And now you're going out. And so it will trigger anxiety to warn you that you're doing something that's potentially risky. What we need to do is hold that anxiety without panicking and reminding ourselves that actually it's okay most of the time. We made a decision to do this and we're doing it in a safe way. We're taking appropriate precautions. Sometimes when anxiety goes off in your mind, the only action and reaction that you need to take is like when your smoke alarm goes off. It's the emotional equivalent of the smoke alarm dance. Everyone knows the smoke alarm dance, right? It's, it's this one when you're just like fanning the smoke alarm or if you have something as clever as a reset button, we've never figured out how to do that, but pressing the reset because it's a false alarm and you will experience anxiety false alarms in this time. The third emotion though that we do need to deal with and be aware of is around loss and grief. And, and for some of us, that may be the grief of bereavement. If this virus has touched you in the worst way, your family, your friends, your loved ones. 
and we didn't have the opportunity to do the normal rituals of grief, normal funerals, the normal stuff we would do when we're bereaved. And therefore many people are finding, particularly now that we're starting to come out and they are now able to meet up with people more, share, discuss, see their friends again. Some of that is coming to the surface. And um, some of us are needing, some people are needing extra support to deal with that. But for everyone, there has been a, a huge experience of loss, whether it is bereavement or whether it's just loss of routine, loss of friendship, loss of security, loss or change of your own understanding of yourself and your vulnerability or invincibility. This has been a time of loss. And I am finding that many people, now that we feel like we're in a phase of starting to relax a little bit right now, Many people are finding to their surprise that emotions that they have probably suppressed in the season when we were more busy, more on high alert, are, that they, those feelings are starting to bubble up now. And actually, so someone said to me the other day, they spoke to an old friend who they'd not seen for three months and they, were the, they looked forward to the call. But when they started talking, they just felt irrationally furious and upset. And they could, they're like, why? And I, they're like, I had to make an excuse and hang up. And like, why, why? And, and as I talked to them, it's like, turns out, that's the first time they spoke to them in three months. And there, there was a huge amount of emotional hurt there to process around. What, what does that mean about that friendship? And, and the fact that they hadn't seen someone for three months and that that person, they, they felt maybe hadn't valued them enough to, to get into touch. You know, there's, there's so much potentially here for all of us, depending on our circumstances, to need to process around loss, bereavement, grief. It's complex. So if you know that, you make some good spaces to do it, to express it, to process it, to talk it through, to pray it through. Maybe even explore a therapeutic space if you need to. And then number three, just as I finished, is, is, is a good one to end on. And it's just the pursuit of good stuff. So just a reminder in a season that will continue to be busy, to be demanding, to be challenging, and particularly if you're juggling work, other responsibilities, caring for families, whatever it is, looking after elderly relatives, whatever, that well-being is about not just avoiding the negative stuff, the bad emotions, it's about triggering the good stuff too. And you know, there's that great verse in Nehemiah that says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. And I love that the ancient Hebrew there in that, that ancient piece of wisdom, the, the word that we translate as strength, literally it means it's your fortress, it's your place of protection. In difficult, stormy or dangerous times, joy and good things can become the thing that you can retreat back to. They're the thing that sustain you, that keeps you going. So, so next time I go out to bike and I cycle to the top of my favorite hill and, and, I, and I love the view, I love the perspective that gives me, it helps me to relax, gives me a sense of peace and it, it helps me with all the things I'm challenging. But, but I also love it because I get to cycle down really fast. And, and I don't care who you are, when you go down a hill fast on a bike, you are 14 again or so I find. And that will trigger joy in the moment, but that's not just an emotional kick for me right then. That triggers and re-triggers the level of neurotransmitters in my brain. It changes things cognitively, genuine physiological changes that, that help keep my mood high, that help counteract the impact of stress, that will help me relax and sleep better later on in that day. So experiencing joy, happiness, things like laughter, pleasure, all of those things are not just little indulgent moments for us. They are what can keep you going. And some of the research looking at resilience through tough times and tragedy shows that things like finding little things, little moments of joy, little good things, little pleasures, little things to hope and set your heart on, little things to look forward to. Those are the things that differentiate who gets through well and who struggles. As much as your experience of negative things, it's about how much can you maintain and build in and be creative with how you find opportunities for good stuff. And it's what psychologists call savoring too. So savoring is when you spot something good. It's like, do, do you spot it? Do you linger in the moment or do you just walk past? And so it's like, like um, one of the things that we know about hugging and physical contact is when we hug another human being, you release a hormone that is involved in um, decreasing your stress response and it helps you bond with that other person and it's massively impactful. But to gain the full value of that hug moment, you have to remain in the hug, wait for it for 20 seconds. 
20 seconds. It's quite long, 20 seconds. Next time you hug someone, if you're in a household with people or if you're bubbled with someone you can hug, count. And if next time you hug someone, they count, you know they were just on this call as well. But 20 seconds. Now that challenges us to savor the moment. And, and a lot of moments are like that. To really get the value out of them, we have to pause in them and linger and not be so busy that we rush by. And, and you know, we have to catch ourselves sometimes on that, don't we? You know, I was saying goodnight to my son the other night and he's like, oh, give me a hug, mommy. And I'm like, oh, flip, I've got to go. I've got so much on. Oh, that's my car alarm going off. Apologies about that. With any luck, someone will turn that off. But so I'm like, I just want to rush, do a quick hug and then run away. But actually, it's like something in my head's like, you idiot. You're about to miss something really valuable here, a really precious moment. So actually, I went back. I was like, mate, can we do that again? And then I'm hugging him. And he's like, mom, get off. We've been in this for ages. And I'm like, no, no, I'm just, I'm counting. We've got to stay here for 20 seconds. Anyway, you get the picture. So pursue good things. I love that one of the New Testament words for pursuit is one that comes from hunting. So it's not just like mildly look, look for them. It's like hunt them down, track them down, chase them. And, and if you spot them, then like literally rugby tackle them, grab onto them because those things are so precious. They can get you through. So those are my three top tips for whatever the next season brings. Thank you very much. That was very, very useful, very, very informative. And it's that kind of giving us a bit of energy, you know, to just go on to the next stage. Mm -hmm. So we do have um, a few questions and also please um, feel free to send questions in the chat. The first question I have is, you know, what is the role of our faith in our mental and emotional health? You know, how can we allow this situation to deep, deep in our faith? Mm. Yeah, that's such a good question, isn't it? And I think one of the interesting things for us all in this season is how this has affected and challenged our, our faith and how we connect with each other, but also with God through church, through services, through rhythms of prayer and, and some of the practices that we might be used to. And how do we experience that connection really genuinely? And it's, it's been tough. And I think the first thing that I would say is that your 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 body and your brain were designed by god so god is right in the midst of that stuff and you know there's an ancient proverb that says that more than anything else you guard guard your mind because life flows from that mm -hmm. so actually our our faith can influence and, and educate us in some of the steps of how we manage some of these difficult things so rest for example we know as people of faith the reason we need to rest so much is because it's built into our dna we're designed reflecting the name nature of God who when he created the world whether you believe that literally or or as, as a sort of more of a fabulistic story he worked and he rested and that ancient rhythm of both working really hard but resting and the clarity between the two having a clear boundary of when are you working when are you resting rather than the kind of messy gray that we've all had because we're home working and it's all just got kind of squashed into the same space you know we can understand why some of those things are so important but better because of our faith perspective because of understanding the god who created us um we can look to jesus for an example as well for example in emotions like dealing with grief we know that when jesus heard that his friend john the baptist has been killed his first response is to try and get, get away to find time to himself because he needs to, to to process what's just happened and of course much like our experience has been in lockdown in that moment he he doesn't get it he's pursued by people who who demand things from him he's got responsibilities he can't take that time out right away and that's when he has to feed the five thousand because it turns out those people didn't even flipping bring their own dinner it's like i don't know if you've had those moments of like am i responsible for everything in this lockdown do i have to think about everyone's needs jesus must have felt like that where he's like gosh they haven't even brought dinner so he feeds them all and then i love the little detail that what but literally it says in the in in the gospel it says the minute they'd finished eating he's like right and he gets the disciples to go off into a boat and he goes off into the mountains for, for, for the time that he's known he's needed to, to pray to catch up with his own thoughts you know we can we can learn so much from the bible about how we act and respond to challenging times. Not exactly like these, because there's nothing about like pandemic, global pandemic, literally in the Bible, but there's so much just great wisdom and truth in there. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. So you mentioned the fact that, you know, um, we're kind of going to, um, we're going to lockdown, you know, we're literally starting to come out of lockdown and there's a lot of anxiety and things as lockdown is eased, you know, and we all have different emotions and, and reactions to them. You know, are there any tips or things that you can give us with how to cope, you know, as we approach this? Um, I, I think there's probably two levels that I'd want to talk about in response to that question, really. And mm -hmm. the first one is probably about the level of difference that we're seeing. So in this season, that there's, there's probably two things that I'm seeing primarily that people are finding hard. And the first one is the level of difference. And, and actually that that's magnifying some of the things people are finding difficult. Because we don't mean to be, but we can be quite insensitive and forget that other people's experience can be so different different to our own and, and I think people are finding that tough whether it's that they're what things that they're reading in the media or they're seeing on social media or conversations they're having with friends um, and so it's remembering things like do you have friends people who you love who are still shielding for whom this is not normal and even when shielding ends in August their, their level of anxiety is going to be much higher their difficulty in terms of deciding what they do next is is much greater it's it's it could be very different to yours if your personal risk is quite low um, mm -hmm. thinking about difference in terms of the experience that we've just had so I spoke to someone very recently who was so upset by this by a, a conversation they'd had in one in a home group around um, what 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 what's what's what are all the best things that you're going to take out of lockdown into your new season and this is a frontline worker who's seen mm. a lot of traumatic stuff and she was like I don't want to take any of this into the mm. new season it's been awful so it's it's just being sensitive to one another recognizing difference and, and really being just proactive and intentional deliberately empathetic mm. Of, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and almost going out of your way to do that getting in so the person you're like oh I wonder I wonder how um I wonder how Anne feels because she's been shielding instead of just thinking I wonder how it feels do you know what text her send her a mm -hmm. message give her a call say mate I was just thinking about you and I was just wondering how does this feel from your perspective because mm -hmm. you're shielding and I'm just wondering how that conversation felt for you and she might say oh it was fine or it might be that actually that's really valued because then she feels heard and she mm. feels seen and she doesn't, you know, so let, that's my number one is just think about how we manage difference. And then number two, I think, is around emotions. We, we find our own emotions the most difficult when we try and fight with them. So they're inconvenient or they're unexpected or we just don't know what to do with them. They're, they're painful. They're difficult. Um, and so we try and push them down and we hope they'll just go away. And, and I always say that's like trying to put an angry cat in a box. I don't know if anybody has cats. We have we have three at the last count I seem to keep acquiring cats and, um, <laughs> and when you have to try and take them to the vet or something you have to try and put them in a box don't you and they don't really want to go so getting them in is quite a lot of work there's like paws coming out ours frequently get out several times and we have to chase them and put them in but even if you get them in and you get the lid down they haven't gone it's not Schrodinger's cat you know they are still there you can hear them you know they're there every once in a while a paw comes out but, mm. but all the more so when you let them out, they, they, they really, they come out fast, don't they? Because all the time they've been in there, they've become pent up. That emotion has grown, it's become more powerful. And so what we need to do in this season is try not to fight with our emotions too much. You know, when you experience something like that lady I told you who was on a call to one of her best friends and suddenly found herself upset and angry, this was not the emotion she wanted to experience in this great reunion moment. But but we, we need to not fight with it. Instead, so what we need to do is be, be relaxed enough to hold it and say, well, that's, I, I, I as a psychologist, I say things are interesting very often. And what I mean by that is let's just hold it and say, this is interesting. Why am I feeling this? Where is it coming from? I, mm -hmm. I validate it. It's okay that I'm feeling it, but I need to understand where it's coming from so I can process mm -hmm. it, so I can move on from it. Mm -hmm. So instead of fighting the inconvenient emotions, thinking, gosh, this, this is a surprise, you know, I, I as a psychologist, I'm the psychologist, but I too have experienced some things in this season where I'm like, gosh, this is a surprise. I kind of wish I wasn't feeling this, mm -hmm. but I am going to have to recognize that this is something that for me has been part of this experience. I'm going to have to process this. There's an awkward conversation I might need to have here. There's a friend I'm going to need to get in touch with, you mm -hmm. know, whatever it is. Thank you. So we've got quite a few questions come through. So the first question is, when so much is unknown or delayed, you know, how do we wait well? I'm finding impatience a struggle. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> That's such a good question. I'm not renowned for my patients, so I'm not sure if I'm the best person to answer that. I, do you know, I think um, my son, uh, I'm making him do these handwriting sheets because through homeschooling, I've discovered just how illegible his handwriting is. Not his favorite thing, but they're, um, they're like old fashioned sayings that he has, and they've got the guidelines. Anyway, one, well, the one he was doing the other day um, was a watched pot never boils. Remember that one? And, and he, he'd never heard that before. He didn't know what it meant. So we were talking about it. And I think this is about boundaries as well and what we place. And, and when there's so much we don't know, the tendency is we, get, we do get drawn into the media spiral because we, we want to hear that the hypothesizing, the ideas, the, the conjecture, because we're trying to find out what's coming sooner than we actually know. And sometimes we just have to accept, you know what, we actually don't know. And it, and it does bug me. I don't understand why when there's going to be an announcement at this time, the government release it to the press at this time. It's mm. I just like, if you're going to announce it here, why don't you just announce it here instead of announcing it over here anyway? Because then you've got this whole space in the middle where everybody's talking about it and guessing and, mm. and that triggers more stress, more anxiety, more difficulty. We're better to put it out of our minds if we can and boundary mm. it and think, when am I going to, when am I going to hear about this? When will I find out? Okay, thank you very much. And the next question is, how can we deal with guilty feelings during lockdown? For example, when others are followed and we're not, or when friends and family re rely on us so much that we don't feel like we have time for ourselves. Yeah, guilt is such an inconvenient emotion, isn't it? Guilt mm. and, um, and, and jealousy, you know, talking about people being furloughed and people not being furloughed. You know, mm. I was just in, in, our, um, in our church, there's two of us on the entire team who haven't been furloughed for the whole season. And, um, and, it's, uh, just, and, and it's all for really good reason, because the nature of our jobs is that actually we, we've, we've needed to stay in role. We've even been in more demand. But I, I run a group as well for frontline workers and I, I've um, spoke, we've spoken a lot in that group around actually struggling sometimes with a lot of jealousy for people who mm. are talking about how they spent three months in their back garden, like digging things. And you just think, are you kidding me? Like my lawn has never been so high because I haven't even been able to get out there. I'm mm. so busy, so tired, so exhausted. So I think mm. guilt and jealousy are two emotions that nobody ever likes to have. And they're good examples of those emotions where actually what we need to do is instead of just trying not to have them, because if only it worked that way, what we need to do is find appropriate spaces where we can express and process them. So not by losing it and yelling at someone who doesn't deserve it, but actually mm. by, by finding a safe space with some good friends who you maybe chat to and pray with and saying, do you know what, can I just talk to you about something that I'm finding really hard right now? I'm feeling really guilty and, and I know this isn't my responsibility and I can't change it, but actually I am feeling really guilty. You know, um, everybody's talking about the amazing quality time they're having with my, ch with their children, but I'm a frontline worker. So mine have been just sent into school the whole time. They, they've hardly seen me. I'm feeling really guilty or I'm feeling jealous or whatever it is, talk it through, express it, process it, maybe pray it through as well. Um, and I, I think, you know, these, um, there's that verse in Philippians 4 that talks about, it talks about anxiety, actually, and worry. It says, don't worry about anything, but in everything through prayer and petition, present your requests before God. And the peace that transcends human understanding will guard your hearts and minds. Mm -hmm. and, and I love that the word that's translated there is worry or anxiety, depending on whichever translation you read. That's an original Greek word that talks about when there's a lot going on, when we're dealing with a lot of emotion, a lot of worry, a lot of demand. And, and the, the word means uh, those moments when your mind is pulled in so many different directions, it's divided, it's like it's torn apart. Mm -hmm. And so what that verse says is don't be torn apart by things, by mm -hmm. just the sheer volume of stuff that's dragging your mind in different directions. Instead, present all that stuff to God. And, and when you do that, something of that prayerful moment, can, can bring a peace that, that's beyond your human understanding, which is definitely what we need in this season. Mm -hmm. So that's where that, that question about how can our faith, how can our spirituality, our understanding that we're people of God, how can that help? Mm -hmm. Sometimes practicing really deliberately new spiritual disciplines, like what it, we as a church, we're just starting Pete Gregg's prayer course. And we're doing that partly because we want to really intentionally say to people, how do you do that? How do you present requests to God? How do you hand stuff over in prayer? How do you experience the peace that transcends understanding? How do you do that well amongst other things? Mm, thank you. 
Um, next question is, um, what behavioral thoughts might we see that are symptoms of high anxiety, stress, or grief? So I guess it's just trying to identify, you know, what is a normal reaction and what are symptoms of high anxiety or stress or grief? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. And I think we're all aware when that baseline is high, either of the, the prickliness, the, just how near the surface our emotions feel. So that sense of, gosh, I'm, I'm, I'm overreacting or I don't feel like I'm acting very rationally here. I've had mm -hmm. people say to me like, gosh, I, I thought I was going crazy. But, but you're not, you're just, you're just on the edge of overwhelm all the time and it changes the way that you act and react. And that can be a short term thing, you know, or what you need to do is find some space, drop that level down and you'll feel much more yourself again. But you're also looking for the sign that things have become more problematic or that they've just, it starts to become more of a long term pattern. So not sleeping is a really good example. So many people struggling with sleep. It's massively common right now loads of sympathy for you if that's something you're struggling with we at mind and soul we did a we a special sleep week um a few weeks ago because we know how big an issue this is and shared loads of tips and tricks for this because it's such a common thing but there comes a point where actually struggling to sleep can become a really serious problem it makes everything else much harder physically emotionally it's really difficult and so if this has become a pattern for you um if it's you're starting to see physical consequences from it you know it's starting to to move into a zone where it's much more serious then you do need to get some help go and talk to your gp that's what they're there for um, and whether it's a physical um sort of consequence of the stress that you're under or whether it is just to say you know gosh emotionally i'm really struggling or stress wise i'm really struggling your gp is a really good place to start having that conversation and they'll be able to link you with other sources of support as well mm -hmm. Thank you. And I think that kind of leads to the next question, which someone had asked, actually, which was, can you provide any tips on falling asleep and being able to have a long, undisturbed night's sleep? So I'm sure that person might not have wanted to just go to their GP, but prior to maybe... Yeah, no, we can definitely talk sleep. It is such a huge, it's such a huge mm -hmm. issue right now. Everyone wants to talk to me about sleep suddenly. And, mm -hmm. and, and some of them have joked that listening to some of my sermon material is very helpful. So, you know... <laughs> Go ahead and try that if it helps. Or find someone really boring and try that. Um, you know, I, I, post, I have some the old theology books that I fall back on at times when I really can't sleep and I find them remarkably um, helpful. But joking aside, the thing with sleep is I want you to, let me, let me paint you a picture. Let's imagine for a moment that we're able to go on holiday. So I know this, this requires a bit of imagination right now, but so you're somewhere hot. And it's a hot day and in front of you there is a swimming pool and nobody else has been in it so it's beautifully smooth and the water's blue and it's got that slight heat haze on it because it's such a beautiful day and you're about to get into the pool it's that wonderful like first moment of a holiday where you're going to have that swim it's it's always such a nice moment now i want to just ask you this question are, how are you going to get in are you going to be one of those people who's going to ease yourself in gently? It's all very graceful. There's a bit of splashing over the shoulder, just getting used to the change in temperature. You're going in down the steps. It's all very Instagrammable and dignified. Or are you one of the people who, whilst, whilst I am doing that, runs in and dive bombs right next to me and splashes me? Do you have people in your family and friend groups who do that? <laughs> I'm one of those. My son is one of those. Now, Sleep is as big a change for your brain as the change is for you going from a hot place into that cold water. It is a totally dramatic change of state. If we measure your brain waves when you're asleep and we compare them to when you're awake, it is totally, totally different. It's a dramatic change. Now, most people cannot do the running and dive bombing method of going to sleep. Most people don't switch dramatically from one state to another. Some people do. And if you, particularly if you're married to one of those people like I am, it is so annoying. My husband is like wired wanting to have in-depth, detailed conversations to the moment that he then lies down, shuts his eyes, and within two seconds, he also snores. So within like two seconds, he's like, <laughs> and I'm like, are you kidding me? This is so annoying. It takes me like half an hour to wind down and get ready to sleep. Very few people can do what he can do. It is, a, it, is a, it is a great gift and I'm very jealous of it. Most of us need to ease into sleep. 
-hmm. And what that means is that you have to be aware of the, the change in state. Give your brain time to switch off. Don't, the things that are particularly stimulating for you, don't do them just before you need to go to sleep. So that's definitely work. Anything that triggers like stress or anxiety or demand on your mind, whatever that stuff is, don't do it. So, and, and as well as that, do do things that help you to relax, to switch off, to ease into a, a, a state that's more conducive to sleep. And find yourself a routine that works and then stick to it. Because remember your brain and the hand holds thing, climbing a wall, it does that to get to sleep too. The more predictable your sleep routine is, the more it tells your mind that you're about to go to sleep. So whatever it is that works for you, try and do it. So I always, always read before I go to sleep. Sometimes, especially in lockdown, I, I've, I've been on the same book for the entire three months because I can only get through like a page and then I'm falling asleep straight away. But I always, always read. But I don't read anything too exciting. I've had disastrous books that have been far too good and I've had to stop reading them at night because they're waking me up because my mind's like, oh, this is exciting. No, I need something that's just right, that's going to engage me enough to distract me from the worries of the day but also it's going to help my brain switch off so if i'm really stressed or life is challenging i always read agatha christie there's something about the way that's written it's just soul soothing plus i've read them all a million times before so i don't need to pay too much attention it's not too crucial it's pretty easy reading find what works for you anyway in your routine and stick to it stick yes. to it absolutely religiously in terms of of what you do. Um, it will help you so much. The other thing in terms of routine for sleep is the thing that you'll hear people say about going to bed and getting up at roughly the same time every day. That's because mm. you have hormones, you have something called your sleep-wake cycle biologically, which is about how your brain and your body expect sleep or waking up at roughly the same time each day. And there are levels of things that change within your body automatically at those times of day. So that just around the time you would normally go to sleep, levels of hormones change that make you feel appropriately drowsy and your body will expect to switch into its nighttime mode, things like that. It's why if you try and stay up later, you will start to feel really sleepy. But the same thing happens in the morning. If you get up at the time you expect to, your brain and your body aren't taken by surprise. They're expecting that to happen. So again, the more you can stick roughly, not obsessively, but roughly to that same routine, the better you will sleep. So, so trying to burn the candle at every end that there is all the week and then sleep for sort of 14 hours at the weekend might feel like a good thing to do, but actually in the long run, it might interfere. We can get into unhelpful patterns with sleep. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah that that would be my number two it's about trying to work with your biology instead of against it as much as you possibly mm -hmm. can okay thank you thank you very much um so the next question is um, how do we deal with the fear or loss of time or opportunity other than tr trusting that god will make up for lost time it's a it's a hypothetical so could we perhaps ignore it but as time passes and restrictions continue it becomes more concrete so the fear, the fear of having lost things or missed out. I, yeah, I, I yes. think what you're talking about there is very much two of those emotions that we were talking about. And it is mm. accepting and not fighting with the fact that there is a grief there. There's a mm. loss there. There's a frustration. Um, mm. This is such an unusual situation, isn't it? I think we're so unused in our current times to things that are outside of our control. Mm. But, but this is, and that's really hard. And, and it's hard on us for ourselves, but it's particularly hard if there are other people we feel responsible for, people we love. Mm. So one of the things I found hardest in this time is the impact that this has had on, on my son in particular, because he's eight. He will have mm. been out of school for six months by the time this, this is hopefully wow. over for him or he goes back mm. to normal. And I, I've seen my little boy shaped by lockdown and by COVID and his experience. Mm. He talks a lot about it. And oh, there's something in me as a parent. I hate that. Mm. Don't want, I, I should be able to protect him from everything and I can't. Mm. And, and there are things like that that we, again, we have to find spaces we can talk and process mm. and express that. So I'm part of a group of people who are homeschooling and dealing with this as parents. And that's been such a valuable space for us just to share some of that frustration and grief and also mm. share some helpful tips and tricks for minimizing the impact. So, so I think it is, again, about just finding spaces to deal with what we're feeling instead of trying not to feel it. But this is one of the reasons why I think this phase, this phase it is taking some people by surprise because there's a surprising amount to process. 
And you think we're going back to normal now, but this is when your brain is like, actually, hang on, there's this big thing here that you need to process that this happened and you couldn't protect your child from it. Wow, that's quite big for me as a mum. And, and, and what does that mean to the way that I approach the rest of my experience as a parent? What are, you know, there are big issues here and we're all different. Our experience has been different. The challenges of this have been different for all of us, but we will all have things that we've understood about ourselves, about the world, about life, predictability, control, safety, security, some of these big topics that mm. we will need to process at coming out of this. And I think mm. this next season will be a lot about us finding spaces. And of course, as people of God, people of the church, we are in a wonderful position to create those safe spaces for people. Mm. Thank you. So our final question before we then probably ask you for resources and things. So final question is, what does it look like to create boundaries around stuff that makes us anxious, but we can't change? What's the process for that? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, I think let's talk about two things. So let's talk about exposure boundaries, first of all. And that is where can you limit your exposure? So we've talk, I've talked quite a lot about exposure to things on media, for example. Exposure mm -hmm. on social media as well. So social media is very often not a helpful space if you're prone to anxiety, but it is somewhere where you're quite drawn. Particularly if you don't have much else to do, the risk is that your fingers are drawn to the Facebook page and you start reading all the stuff that people are posting. And, and you know, honestly, I'm, I'm my first degree is medicine. So I'm a medic first, psychologist second, and I cannot tell you how grumpy I get on Facebook because like I say, my tolerance is low anyway right now. Mm -hmm. And I read stuff on there. Someone had posted, someone from our church had posted and created a whole like churchy discussion around um, that Facebook face masks drop your oxygen level and they're dangerous. And I'm like, oh my goodness, that is so not true. And this is someone who is quite intelligent. And uh, I got grumpy and it wasn't fair because people are anxious. And they'd read this and thought, gosh, is this true? Let's post it, let's see what people think. And so just be careful. There is stuff on there that you don't need to read, you don't need to know about. Stick mm -hmm. to reliable sources. If you do read something on there, then check something like the BBC or check the World Health Organization, check with a reliable source before you panic, because most of the stuff that you read that's alarming probably isn't true. So mm. just be careful with your exposure to. If you're finding it difficult, I do know some people who have made the decision to come off social media right now, and I think for some people that's a really good decision. Or just mm. be careful about which social media you use or how you use it. And that that's really my other thing that I would talk about, so general mm. exposure. The second is planning. So we can help ourselves with boundaries around anxiety by planning when and how we do things. And that might be when and how we do things that might expose us to anxiety triggers, like when do I check my social media? When do I, when do I work? When do I rest? When do I play? Things like that. But it might also be limiting times when you give yourself a headspace to think about things. And I know this sounds it's weird but it is a well recognized thing for dealing with anxiety and worry that the best way to deal with them is to create a space and boundary it and say this is where i'm going to worry so here's the things i'm worried about and this is the time of day that i'm going to worry about and this is how i'm going to do it i'm going to do it really properly i'm not just going to have it in the back of my mind all day what i'm going to do is a, a at five o'clock while, while you know the kids are in the bath or when I finish work for the day before I have dinner or whatever it is, I'm going to go down and I'm going to sit at the kitchen table. I'm going to piece, get a piece of paper and I'm going to do it really properly. I'm going to write down everything that's worrying me in one sheet of paper. I'm going to note that that's in one column. In the other column or the next piece of paper, I'm going to write down everything that I need to do, all the actions I need to take, all the things that are worrying me that I've got to work out when I'm going to do them. And you do it really thoroughly. And you set your watch or a timer or the kitchen oven clock or whatever it is, and you limit it. So you think, I'm going to spend half an hour doing that, or maybe 45 minutes, or maybe an hour if you think, like, gosh, I've got a lot that I really do need to do. And then when it's done, you fold up the paper, you put it away, maybe you journal in that time, you put the journal on the shelf, whatever it is, and then you leave it until the next slot that you've got. And what that means is that in the day when some of those worries start to bubble up, you can think, no, no, because five o'clock is my time. I will think about that then I'll sort it out then. Mm -hmm. And actually lots of research shows that that really does help. I know it sounds weird, but that it really does help because it boundaries your worry. If particularly anxiety is keeping you awake at night, 
there are studies that show that doing that in the evening before you go to sleep really helps to stop that constant ticking in your mind, getting it out of your brain. You know, if you go shopping and you have like five things you need to buy and you've not written them down, while you're going around the supermarket, you have to keep reciting them, don't you? Especially if you've got to my age, you do. Because you forget them. You go in there, you can't remember a thing. So you're walking around the shop going bread, milk, cheese, ham, eggs, bread, milk, cheese, ham, eggs, going through them on your hand. And, and what we're talking about is a similar thing. If, if your anxieties are just in your head, your brain has to keep them spiraling round and round to make sure that you don't forget them. Because their job is to get your attention. But if you write them down, it's like writing your shopping list down and then, oh, the relief, you don't have to keep reciting the things you've got to remember. And it's the same with your anxieties. If you've written them down, if you've written them out, it's like your brain can say, okay, phew, I can let that go for a bit now. Mm. So boundary it and do it really well and get it out of your head onto paper. Thank you. So we've just got about five minutes left, but before we do that, are there any resources that you'd recommend for anyone who's struggling at the moment? Well, I would definitely recommend that you head to the Mind and Soul Foundation website. So okay. that's Mind and Soul Foundation, all as one word, dot org, because we have um, all all kinds of resources on there from articles through videos talks but also links to other organizations doing wonderful stuff you can search on that site on topics or there's a there's a banner on the front page for stuff that's been specifically related to covid so do go to the website do also check out our social media so we are at mind and soul uk on all of the on twitter facebook and on instagram some of our stuff we don't put on the website we just alert you to it on our social media so particularly if we're linking you into an event or a talk or an opportunity to to connect and share with something then it will go on our social media okay Okay, thank you. Thank you so much.